Good morning. This morning in worship, we have heard just the very tail end of the story of the man born blind. This is a day when you should be praying for your brothers and sisters across the church that observe the revised common lectionary, especially traditional Lutherans, Episcopalians, and Catholics just had to stand through what amounted to a chapter of the Gospel of John. Your knees get to shaken by the end of those long readings, uh, but we amended them here so that you wouldn't have to stand up quite as long, and so that I can tell you the story of the man born blind. In his story, <clears throat> Jesus and his buddies see a man born blind beside them. The disciples, in uh, surprisingly, uh, what, surprisingly uh, callous way, start talking about the man born blind as if he isn't even there. Don't talk, brothers and sisters, about people who are right there as, uh, as if they weren't. That's just rude. Jesus seems to want to teach them at least that message. They ask him, Lord, who sinned? Why is this man blind? Did his parents sin? Or did he sin somehow uh, as an embryo? And Jesus says, guys, you don't get it. This moment isn't meant uh, for deciding who sinned, how, and when. This moment is going to be a moment that God's glory is revealed. And indeed, it is. Jesus walks up to the man and unserious unceremoniously spits on the ground, makes some mud from his spittle and the dirt, and then takes that and spreads it on the man's blind eyes. There is uh, no mention in the story whether or not the man recoils in horror at the uh, gooey goodness that is being spread across his eyes. Instead, he seems to receive that gift and submit himself to whoever is touching him. Jesus then says, go and wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Uh, that word, Siloam, means the scent pool. So for many, many years, we Christians have thought of this story as somehow describing something of our baptism. That is our scent pool. It is not our get-out-of-hell-free pool. It is our scent pool. Pool. It is the place where the light of God starts to shine through us in a new and special way so that we're able to join the family business of unconditional love, grace, mercy, peace, and justice. And we're able to do that with our eyes having been cleared with a new vision for how the human family can be together. So he goes to the scent pool washes his eyes, and his eyesight is restored. Well, this sets everybody a murmuring. First of all, uh, the folks that uh, spend time in those parts say, hey, uh, isn't that the man born blind? Hey, buddy, what happened to you? How is it that now you see? And he says, well, the Jesus guy came and, and fixed me up. Spit on the ground put some mud on my eyes, told me to go wash in Siloam, and now I see. Well, this was quite the, uh, quite the news for their little town, and eventually it finds its way, that news does, into the ears and minds and hardened hearts of the Pharisees, the uh, perpetual uh, bad guys in the Gospel of John. I give thanks uh, that Christianity in its friendship with Judaism has come so far that Rabbi Linder will be preaching for us next Sunday in this space, and I will be preaching at Temple Solel this Friday night. Uh, we've, we've come a long way. We have further to go, but I give thanks that we're not stuck in that same kind of antagonism that sometimes undergirds the Gospel of John in a way that's uncomfortable for most of us uh, to, to hear and, and uh, experience. 
Uh, but uh, the religious establishment eventually comes to the man born blind and says, hey, uh, tell us what's going on here. And they've got a, a big beef with the situation because Jesus performed this healing on the Sabbath when you're not supposed to work too hard. So the man gives him his testimony, gives them his testimony, and then um, they, for some reason, can't accept it. They spend some time interviewing his parents. Uh, his parents are afraid of getting into trouble, so they say, ask him. He's of age. You can, uh, if he's going to get himself in trouble, let him get in trouble. Uh, leave us out of it. Uh, and so they go back to the man. He, um, he starts to get a little uppity with these uppity religious authorities. They say, all right, tell us the truth. Uh, this, this doesn't make any sense. And uh, who do you say that Jesus is? And he says, well, I, I think he's probably a prophet. Uh, uh, well, uh, tell us again how this happened. He says, I already told you all how this came down, uh, and you wouldn't listen to me. Are you checking all of these details because you want to become his followers? And you're, you're testing him out? Oh, that got them so darn mad, and they got right up in his face, and he could actually see them this time getting up in there in his face. And uh, he, uh, they say to him, you know, you were born in sin, and this Jesus guy is a terrible guy. He's definitely a sinner, if not an agent of anti-God. Um, and, and what they do is they kick him out of the synagogue. They say, you're no longer welcome among us for your blasphemy and your heresy and your lying. So it's at that point, after the man has been cast out of proper religious community, that Jesus comes to him. And you hear, uh, you hear the exchange then that Deacon Jane read for us. Uh, Jesus comes up to the guy and says, hey, do you believe in the Son of Man, the Divine One? And the guy says, well, uh, sure, yeah, uh, he healed me, but where is he? Consider this, of course, the man doesn't know what Jesus looks like, even though he's been healed by him, because when he was healed, he was blind. So, uh, Jesus says, well, I'm the one who healed you, the one who's speaking to you now. And in that moment, uh, the man born blind comes to a sense of deep and complete faith, in Jesus as the savior of the world and as the savior of his sight. It's a beautiful story, this ancient story, about once being blind and then seeing. And it teaches us at least a couple things that we as people of Jesus should keep close to our hearts in this Lenten journey we're making to Easter. First of all, it tells us that seeing Jesus, knowing Jesus, befriending Jesus, understanding Jesus is a process. It is a gift. And everybody is at a slightly different place in that process. Maybe Jesus is putting the equivalent of spittle mud on your eyes. Maybe Jesus is just beginning to reach into your life in a way that you can feel it. And he's bringing a new kind of imagination for grace, love, mercy, and peace. Maybe it's just starting. Maybe you've experienced some healing, but you don't quite know who this Jesus is for you yet. Like when the blind man says that he thinks he's a prophet. Jesus must be a prophet. Otherwise, how could these amazing things be happening? Or maybe uh, the healing has come, the eyesight has been restored, you've tried on all sorts of different answers, but finally Jesus himself comes to you in a way that you can no longer ignore. And then that friendship becomes very clear. And whatever word you may de use to describe that friendship, it is passionately offered to him and to the world around you.
Getting to know Jesus is a process. My goodness, brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't even ask his own guys, the 12, who walk with him basically every day of his three-year ministry. He didn't ask, who do you say that I am, until he'd spent almost the whole three years with them. So, give yourself some time. Give one another some time. Give the people in your life some time. Everybody is on a journey in getting to know Jesus. And everybody moves along that journey at different rates, at different times, in different seasons. And apparently, with Jesus, that's okay. The other warning that we should hold close to our heart as Jesus people in a Lenten pilgrimage to Easter is this. Religious community can hurt faith in Jesus as much as it helps faith in Jesus. It is so easy for our rules and our ways and our understandings to take the place of Jesus on the throne of God. And then religious community becomes a religious co-op, a religious co-op filled with functional atheists who don't actually believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, the pastor of this and every church, and the chief evangelist of a new way forward for the human family. And when that happens, when we stop listening for the living voice, we become the Pharisees. And the story of the church over the last half century is a story of people who no longer feel welcome among us in Christian community because we've told them, unless you can sign off on every jot and tittle, then you are not a real Christian. And in that environment of judgment, they left. And some of them have come to experience the risen Jesus in a powerful way outside of religious community, just as the man born blind didn't actually come to see Jesus and experience Jesus and profess faith in Jesus until he'd been kicked out of the synagogue. So we must be cautious, brothers and sisters, that we don't expect everybody to be on the same page as you are, or as the same page as I am, when it comes to Jesus. Everybody's on a journey, and we are all meant to journey together gently, kindly, so that our love for one another on the journey might bear witness to a world that desperately needs to see that love really could be the foundation of our human family's way of living together. Amen.